in today's second reading. Rejoice always. Easier said than done, huh? And sometimes it's much, much easier than other times. Brothers and sisters, we celebrate this weekend Gaudete Sunday. That's why we wear the rose. It reminds us that Christmas is almost here. The Messiah has almost arrived. It's like in the dawn as the sun begins to rise and the horizon is set on fire. That's the reason we wear the rose, because the sun is on his way. And not only on Christmas, but indeed at the end of time. The Lord will come in his own time, but he will come in glory and power, and all will know the ultimate victory of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so we wait. We wait in joyful expectation. We rejoice at the ultimate triumph that is to come. But again, easier said than done. How can we strive to be open to the joy that God wants to give us? Because he does want to give us joy, a deep, lasting joy, which is different than passing delight, passing happiness. It's different than the experience of ups and downs in everyone's life. Deep Christian joy is rooted in the virtue of hope, a belief of the ultimate victory of God over death and suffering and sin. A number of years ago, I had the great fortune of staying at the Little Sisters of the Poor in St. Louis. I was passing through and they were kind enough to offer me a little room. And I remember passing through the hallway to get to my little apartment and seeing a wonderful little sign on one of the residents' front door, really quite marvelous. And it was so marvelous that I took a photograph and it's still on my telephone. It said, every person needs three things to be happy. Every person needs three things to be happy. Someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Someone to love, something to do, and something to hope for. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And this is not a kind of throwaway line from a stupid Hallmark card. It's rooted, I think, as flowery as the sign was on that resident's door, in good psychology, and indeed, in the Bible, in sacred scripture, in the lessons that we are given by the very word of God. Someone to love, something to do, something to hope for. I might rephrase it slightly, or compact these three needs to be happy. Communion, purpose, heaven. Communion, purpose, heaven. And to the degree that we have these realities in our life and are working for them and building them up, our openness to the joy that God would give us is much wider. To the degree that we fight against these realities, we close ourselves off to the joy that God wishes to bestow upon us. Communion, love. Now, my brothers and sisters, this love that the Christian is called to is not the kind of ordinary love that the world speaks of, though the ordinary love that the world speaks of is pretty good too, pretty nice too. Someone can have a pretty wonderful marriage, I would offer, without faith. Yes, I believe that. It can be pleasant and good, and you can even raise good kids. But you will never know the real meaning of your life. You will never know the depths of love to which you are called unless one has received the revelation of Jesus Christ and love as he loves, which is difficult, which is hard, which involves death to self. My brothers and sisters, in the book of Genesis, we have the initial response of Adam and Eve to the fall when they are asked by God, how did this happen? How did you end up eating the, the fruit that I explicitly told you not to eat? And what did they say? Adam and Eve do not say, you know what? I messed up. I didn't do my job. 
I didn't protect my wife. I didn't protect my husband. No. Eve and Adam say, she made me do it. He made me do it. There's blame cast upon the other. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And so it is with our own experience and reality of love in our life. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to be very clear. There are some relationships and some individuals whose wounds and struggles, and at times perhaps mental illness, can make this reciprocity of love very challenging. And it lies upon you, it lies upon you to love as Christ loves, even if they may not be able to give that love back. There are relationships where it is one-sided, as challenging as that is. I think of parents to children who are suffering or laboring. I think about relationships in families among siblings where there's a, there's a, a real hurt there that just can't be overcome unless God intervenes. But, but, most of the time, I got to say that there is a lack of love in our life, real deep love, because we refuse to love, because we make all kinds of excuses. Again, they should do that, they should do this. When the Lord is inviting us to take responsibility for our own love, I'm watching some videos by a motivational speaker by the name of Jocko. Some of you may know this guy, Navy SEAL guy, who now uh, offers leadership seminars and has a book, uh, Extreme Ownership. And it's all about lessons of leadership from Navy SEALs. And needing to grow as a leader, I'm trying to soak in what I can. And this title, Extreme Ownership, indicates the need for the leader and for individual members of a team to take responsibility, to not look for blame in other people, to not look for blame in the circumstances, no, but to say, I need to do better. Now, this can be taken to an extreme, this can become neurotic, but I do think that because we are fallen, because we are sons and daughters of Adam, we oftentimes look for excuses. And we oftentimes say that it's someone else's fault. Why aren't there deeper relationships in my life? Because I don't love as I ought. Because I look for people who can feed me without having to feed them back. Why is there such a, a shallowness in my life? Because I am unwilling to suffer for other people. My brothers and sisters, to be happy requires that we strive to grow in communion with one another. Because that's how we've been made. We've been made to be in communion. And it requires that we sacrificially give of ourselves to the other so that we might be present to them and so that we might truly walk with them. So, is there a lack of love in my life? Is that why I'm not as happy as I ought to be? Purpose. Every single human being, believer or not, needs a purpose. And there have been many, many psychological studies and plays and movies and series about the, the psychological difficulty of someone who has done something all of their life and then retires and spirals down out of control because their life no longer makes any sense. Now, it doesn't always happen. There are some of you who are very happily retired. <laughs> but oftentimes, it's true. Someone gives themselves to something for so long, their identity becomes bound up in it, and when it is taken from them, it is really, really hard. My brothers and sisters, for the Christian, our purpose for being is the salvation of souls. And that goes for the reverend clergy as well as the laity. We have an obligation to bring people to Jesus and to do it not first and foremost by great apologetic arguments, but by our kindness, by our love, by our presence. My dear friends, all of us are called to be evangelists. All of us, by the waters of the font, we have been given a mission, and we have a purpose of life. Whether we are a homebound grandpa who has been forgotten by his family, or a young family with kids that are 
messy and all over the place and wonderful, whether we are a deacon or a priest, whatever, our fundamental call is the same. Be holy, bring others to Jesus. Be holy, bring others to Jesus. Repeat, that is our call. That is the purpose of our life. No matter what from an earthly perspective is taken from us, that remains constant. Our call is to bring others to Jesus, first and foremost, by our kindness and our love and our compassion. We have a purpose. No matter how crazy the world may be, we have a purpose. And we must strive to live it. And if we don't live it, our life will be void of that deep joy that God wants to give it. Finally, I promise you finally, something to hope for, for the Christian this is heaven. My brothers and sisters, there are many different personalities within the communion of saints. You got on the one side, St. Therese of Lisieux, who probably smiled at everything. Now, of course, that is not entirely true. We know that the last weeks and months of her life were very, very challenging. But a pretty beautiful and wonderful and I would guess optimistic kind of gal. Then you got people like St. Polycarp, the disciple of St. John the Evangelist, who we are told was extremely cantankerous and in fact even punched one of his debate partners, called him a son of Satan. Not exactly, you know, a man of dialogue there, huh? You got these figures of, that are both optimistic and looks at the world, frankly, with the glass half empty. There are saints who were, by nature, pessimistic. I think that's okay to say. Because you are a, a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you have one single kind of personality, or you got to be outgoing, or you have to be happy all the time. No. You have to enthrone Jesus at the center of your life and have deep theological hope, a belief in the ultimate triumph of the good, both St. Therese and cantankerous Polycarp knew that Jesus wins. They both knew it. And they both longed for the coming of the Lord and that place that we call heaven where death and suffering are no more and loved ones are again seen and held. Now, my brothers and sisters, if there is not a love of heaven in some kind of, at least abstract kind of way, a kind of opening of our eyes to the world to come, we will seek to find our hope in stuff here. Bigger TVs, bigger cars, bigger houses, the respect of other people, the satisfaction of our spouses. All of these things, obviously there's a hierarchy there of goods, but none of them will satisfy, none of them. Our heart longs for that which it cannot fully devour here on earth. Only in the world to come is the fullness of revelation revealed and we experience. And to have a longing for heaven, we must be people of prayer. How oftentimes we sacrifice prayer for action. Why? Because we don't believe that he can do it. We believe in ourselves. I must do this. I must do that. I will not wait for the Lord. I will do it. My brothers and sisters, I realize this isn't always the case. There must be both prayer and action. But it happens a lot, doesn't it? We know that this activity right in front of us, oh boy, I got to get this done right away. I hear Jesus inviting me to pray. Come on, come on, come back later. I can take care of that later. Well, later comes and then it's time to go to bed. How many excuses do we have for prayer? Oh, we must do this, we must do that. And we lose our thirst for the things that will ultimately satisfy us and that the world ultimately needs. Are we people of prayer? And if we are not, do we have any wonder why there is such franticness in our life? If we can't sit and wait for the Lord, why are we so surprised by our li that our life is pulled in a thousand different directions? Someone to love. Communion. Are we willing to be about the hard work of loving? Something to do. Do we recognize that our purpose for being as Christians is to bring others to Jesus? Something to hope for. Are we people of prayer, praying for a hunger and a thirst for the world to come? 
The the Lord wants to make you happy, my brothers and sisters, but not the happiness of the, the world. He wants to give you a lasting joy that nothing can rob you of. You may have moments of great suffering. You almost certainly will. Even existential terror. But deep within, the Lord wants to convince you of the ultimate triumph of good over evil. So let us open wide our hearts to love, to meaning, to the path to heaven, where all of the longing of our human hearts